an alcoholic and an addict. I'm also a liar, a cheater, a convict, many other things, and all those things are a direct result of my substance abuse. For me, it's the final stage of addiction. That's using drugs and alcohol and to cope with the uh, consequences of using drugs and alcohol. And once you've reached that stage, your life gets pretty bleak. Every addict sort of has a group of yets, and those are the things that they'll never do to support their addiction. And mine was stealing from my family, and I meant directly stealing, because I certainly stole their, their resources. I went through treatment 15 times. I had to pay for numerous attorneys. I spent a couple years in jail, but I never actually went into their house and stole from them directly. And that was something that I kind of had a bravado about, because I'd hear people in other treatment centers who had done things like that. And I was like, wow, well, I never did that. Um, well, I got very addicted to heroin, and I had a massive habit that I had to support on a daily basis and it was just impossible to do so. So uh, I went to their house and I started stealing my mother's jewelry and it started with um, just a tiny little gold bracelet and uh, in the course of a couple months I ended up stealing $50,000 worth of jewelry and selling it for pennies on the dollar. And uh, that's not even the, the real disrupted part. The reason I like this example was because there was moments of clarity where I felt bad, like the man with the, uh, the pearl necklace and I said, I was living with, um, with a girlfriend at the time, and I, I told her, I got upset, I think I actually broke down, I said, look, I've been stealing all this jewelry from my family, and, um, and she called my parents and she told them what I was doing, and uh, they live in Boston, they live in a um, kind of like a condo complex with security, and they, uh, they changed the code so my card wouldn't access their apartment, so I couldn't go back in there, and even knowing that they had done that, the next day I went back to their house, broke into the building and tried to break into the apartment to get, uh, to steal more jewelry. And, and I got caught and I got forcibly removed from the, uh, from the situation. But like that's, that's for me the ultimate example of the, uh, the disrupted, uh, disrupted prefrontal cortex and you know, and just how your midbrain is hijacked. So. We've got this disrupted prefrontal cortex. We have got kids who are living in a culture of addiction. We have got kids who in the norm are not necessarily functioning particularly well. First time somebody does Percocet, we'll use Percocet for instance, something happens in their brain, a neuron lights up. It might be the first time they felt comfortable in their own skin. It might have been the first time social anxiety was quiet. It may have been that they felt like they had heard the answer to every question they'd ever had. And that's an important moment in the brain, and the brain said, remember this. They may have gotten it when they got their wisdom teeth out, they may have gotten it out of our medicine cabinet, they may have gotten it very, very innocently after you know, breaking a leg, having an accident. Neuron lights up. The next time they thought about this, they didn't even have to actually repeat the doing of the Percocet. They just had to think about it and remember what it was like and live it in their body and another neuron lights up and it connects to the last one. This is the neuroscientific principle called fire together, wire together. The more you think about something, the more you are developing a pathway. It isn't just about the doing. So what does an addict or an alcoholic think about all day long? Using it. How do I get it? How do I get the money for it? How do I get away with using it? How do I get my drug and get away with using it? And it takes a lot of thinking, and it's a 24-hour, <coughs> seven-day-a-week job, and this neural pathway of addiction is growing every time they're thinking about it. Every time. That's the bad news. The second principle is use it or lose it. When they quit thinking about doing drugs and start thinking about recovery, start thinking about what's the next right thing to do, how do I cope with life without using drugs, how do I become the man I want to become, they develop a second neural pathway and they start shrinking the original one. And you've all experienced this. If anybody has tried to go back and do algebra after 30 years, and you look at an equation and you go, oh my god, that's x and y, but those are just letters to me. There is no equation possible. That is use it or lose it. That is meant it was gone. Doesn't mean it can't come back. 
but the neural pathway of mathematics shrunk. It shrunk. So what does that mean for an addict? What it means is that they actually have to develop a second neural pathway. There's an old Native American story where the young man goes up to the elder and says, Grandfather, I have two wolves living in my head, one that is mean and angry and jealous, and one that is kind and generous and compassionate. And then grandfather nods and he says, yes, well. And he said, what I want to know, grandfather, is which wolf wins? And the elder looks at him and says, the one you feed. And that is the truth about addiction and recovery as well. When people go to meetings, when they work a program of recovery, when they feed the recovery wolf, they grow this second neural pathway. And they actually change their brains again. From being not just a person who doesn't use, but become a person who wouldn't use. That's the key. The more they focus on recovery, not just abstinence. Abstinence, has anybody heard the concept of a dry drunk? Okay. So what's a dry drunk? A dry drunk is somebody who has the neural pathway of alcoholism or addiction, simply doesn't use, clamps down on the impulse to use, but doesn't grow a second neural pathway of recovery. Make sense? They aren't really changing their brains. They're simply ceasing the activity.